Welcome to another episode of Nuts and Bolts with Marquise. Hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the color blue. <laughs> this is an accident, but this is not. <laughs> where do you want to start? Wow, where to start? I, I found a really great quote here by the um, yeah, let's hear it. by the Italian artist Cinini. This is 14th, 15th century. Couple of sentences. Blue. A color illustrious, beautiful, and most perfect beyond all other colors. One could not say anything about it or do anything with it that its quality would not still surpass. So when I read that, I thought to myself, wow, I have to read this a couple more times to mm -hmm. understand what he is implying. So one more time, just like poetry. Blue. One could not say anything about it or do anything with it that its quality would still not surpass. So when I gave that some thought, Maria, I thought its quality would surpass anything that could be said about it, anything that could be done with it. And then I realized, oh, he's talking about transcendence, this transcendent quality. Mm -hmm. I really like that. So my associations are not anything, I don't think terribly new or different from the millennia of human beings who have associative feelings about color. Mm -hmm. So this idea of expansiveness could be attributed to how the sky looks, let's say at dusk. Uh, I really like looking at the sky at dusk, that light blue at the horizon, but then you start to look up and it gets into that deep, dark, radiant, mm -hmm. expansive dark blue, or the blue of water, lakes, streams, oceans, so this is, this is nothing new, and that's the interesting thing about color and our perception of color is that we, if we really stop and think about it for even a moment, we realize, oh, there's all these associations that are really primal at their, at their base. I do think of Picasso and his blue... Um, blue period. Series, the blue period, yes. Mm -hmm. that I mean, he probably didn't choose the color blue by accident to no. depict all those sad uh, moments and sadness in people. Right. right. Well, that's the thing about color in general is that all the colors have not just positive associations, but not so positive. Mm -hmm. But then uh, counter to that, I immediately go to Giotto, mm -hmm. uh, the great Italian um, Renaissance uh, painter of frescoes. And I think about that ceiling yeah. that he created in, um, in Padua of the monastery and how those incredible rich blues are just uplifting. I haven't been there yet, that's, that's on my to-do list. Some of these blues were very difficult to come by, very expensive, but mm -hmm. also dangerous. The process, the alchemy behind it, such that I remember reading somewhere where painters were um, charging by the square inch. So if a patron wanted a painting, <laughs> and wanted an ultramarine blue, the, I could just imagine the painter going, dearly. okay, well, you want that much blue? Let me do the math. Yes, that will be X amount because you know, this is ultramarine blue or cobalt right. that we're using and I've got at least six square inches here. Can you imagine? And that's why it was reserved for churches because of the rich patrons who okay. were amongst other things paying for these big surfaces of blue actually showing their wealth in that oh, matter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. When I put it into my work, I don't put it in right away. It's, an, it's interesting the more I think about this. I might introduce a lot of other colors and I, I might have blue in the beginning, but typically I may put a series of blues in certain paintings to stabilize, create that calm or have a moment of rest for the eye. But it also depends, Marie, on how much white I might use, for instance. So here's the point. If I put blue, right out of the tube into a painting where it's full saturation, it definitely has power. Mm -hmm. it, but the same is true of yellow and red, but a different kind of power. That's the interesting thing to consider. So if I put, let's say, ultramarine blue straight out of the tube into a painting, it's quite dark. But if I scrape that surface to reveal its nature or put a little bit of white into it, it illuminates. That's another quality, I think. Mm -hmm. of blue is the illumination quality. So it just, uh, again, when we get into the discussion of color relationships, blue has a special place for me.
Uh, one more artist to mention about Blue yes. and that when I was doing some research on Blue, because there's so many different artists that one can think about, consider, attribute to. But Yves Klein comes, mm -hmm. came into my mind, the French artist who, whose signature color really was ultramarine blue, speaking yeah. of ultramarine blue. He really wanted to not only embrace, but obsess on a given color, in this case, ultramarine blue, made entire paintings just with ultramarine blue, or better yet, in his performance art, mm -hmm. would paint um, nude women, completely cover the bodies in blue and have them press themselves up against a surface or a canvas, and that was, uh, that was Eve Klein. Anyway, yeah. so we're gonna go into the studio here and have some fun with blue. Yep. There are so many blues to choose from, but if I had to pick four of my go-to favorites, they would be the following. Cerulean blue, a very beautiful light blue, used by the French in painting their skies, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, and phthalo blue. They vary quite a bit in their look, their temperature to some degree, but also their value. So let's take a look at what happens when I add small amounts of white. The best way to really understand the true nature of certain colors, particularly when they come out of the tube so dark, is first of all by scraping. Once I lay this down, I just scrape, and you can see the difference. So that's one great way for a color to, quote, reveal itself to you. And then by varying degrees of admixtures of white, that will also reveal quite a bit about a color's temperature, about its saturation, and about its value. So you can see the difference between the cerulean blue, very light blue, the cobalt blue, very rich and very wonderful, the ultramarine blue, moving towards the violet, as you can see, and the phthalo blue, which produces these really vibrant, almost leaning towards turquoise, if you will. This, this gives you some great um, blue-greens, by the way. Well, they all do. Now, it also should be noted that each of these colors has, has its own what is called is tinting strength. That is the ability of one color to alter another color. So for instance, the cerulean blue has a weaker tinting strength than the cobalt. The cobalt has a weaker tinting strength than the ultramarine. And the phthalo blue has the strongest tinting strength. It only takes a small amount to change another color. So it's, use, it's, it's useful to know that information as well. Well, now let's see what happens when we mix these with the yellow, because you're going to get a whole different variety of greens as well. Let's take a look. The yellow I chose for this demonstration is Cad Yellow Light, but you could use any number of yellows. It really doesn't matter that much. Every, every yellow is going to give you <laughs> different greens. So Cad Yellow Light, um, let's begin. Here is the admixture of the Cerulean Blue. I, I start with just a small amount to see what I've got. I tend to do that. I tend to use a small amount. There's my yellow grain. But let's just go for sort of a secondary green, shall we? I'll just do it once. So this is uh, getting close to a secondary green. Of course, there are many greens in between, all your yellow greens, and you can experiment with that. But I'm just going to do this once. So there's the green that we're getting with a secondary green. I'm going to scrape a little bit of this, which reveals a little bit more about its hue. Let's go to the cobalt blue and see how we do there. Again, I'm going to try to go for a secondary hue. So we'll take a look while I'm mixing at your, and you can see it's a stronger tinting strength already. So it's taking a little less of this blue to alter. So I got to my secondary color sooner, and you can see that. Let's see how this looks. Are these considered warm or cool blue? Of the four, I tend to, in the past, think of the ultramarine blue as the warmer blue, and the rest of them is much cooler. Um, but it's an interesting, that whole conversation about which blue is warm or cool is hotly debated these days. And I won't go down that rabbit hole for too long, but for the longest time, I have believed that the ultramarine blue is the warmer blue. And in fact, many manufacturers uh, label it as a warmer blue.
However, there are those who believe that it is a cooler blue because it goes towards violet. But we're getting into the weeds about this, so it's really not terribly important. What's more important is this, Maria. Knowing what this blue will do with a given white, yellow in this case, or other colors. That's And also what it looks like next to other colors. That's really more important, if you will. Okay. All right. Next, let's take a look at the ultramarine blue. Now, it's going to have even a stronger tinting strength. So I've laid them out in accordance with their tinting strength. It's gonna take even less. There is hardly any blue on my palette and already I've got that as a yellow green. You see, it doesn't take much. So I'm gonna go for secondary greens here today. I could put out any, and by the way, for you artists and designers out there who are watching this, I urge you to add blue at least three different times so you get a yellow green, a green which is secondary, and a blue green. But for purposes of time, I'm going to just mix it to a secondary green which sits somewhere between the yellow and the blue. Let's just go with this for now. Hmm? a little more muted. It, it is a little more dull. And that's the thing about the ultramarine blue. So the ultramarine blue of these four blues will create greens that are a little less vibrant, a little less prismatic. Finally, let's see what happens with the phthalo blue. It's the last blue that we're experimenting with. And it is the strongest of all four of these in terms of its tinting strength. It takes so little. I mean, there's a tiny amount on my and look at that, it really is very strong, almost a bully. <laughs> In my college classes at CCA, I advocate the use of phthalo blue, but with a warning about how strong it is. Let's take a look at this one, very different from the rest. So you're gonna get some very intense greens when you use this. And if I had this, by the way, with a cool yellow, which is your Hansa yellow or lemon, that green would be even more intense. So what are we learning from this? Maria's question is a great question. What are we taking away from this? Why do we do this? And the answer is pretty simple. In order to, because there are so many choices, it's important to know the language of these colors, in this case, blue. And the best way, really the only way to learn that, because there are so many choices, is to, in this case, focus on four blues, add a little white, see what's possible, add yellow, which is a light value, and you're gonna find out very quickly what certain blues can or cannot do, what colors they can or cannot produce. That's really at the heart of our experimentation here. And it only takes 10 minutes or so to find that out. That way you won't be so surprised or even disappointed if you're wanting to get a certain let's say secondary or tertiary color, and you just can't get it. This is a huge problem for a lot of painters and designers. So knowing what your primary colors can or cannot do is essential. For instance, if a painter is trying to get this particular green, but not using this blue, they can try all day long and it's not gonna happen. Or vice versa, maybe they want a, a green that's more muted. So knowing which blue can give you, in this case, different greens, so essential. Then there's no guesswork. You know exactly where to go. After this demo, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? Hmm. Well, I, 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 would like to, I would like to think, I would hope, that our discussion of yellow, red, and blue will peak person's interest in experimentation. I think that's what I want to say at the end of these three color uh, conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, so many painters are confused, and for good reason. Color is so vexing. Uh, I forget who said that, but someone said that. It's vexing because it's mysterious. It doesn't always behave. Mm -hmm. It certainly doesn't always go the way we think it 
might want to go or we would like it to go. And so for that reason, the importance, Maria, of experimentation, it's everything. It's so much trial and error. Trial and... I'll be honest with you all, even in doing these videos, I've learned something more. No matter how many years one is at this, there's always room for that other level, that other layer of understanding. So having these videos has been a good opportunity for me <laughs> to even learn one more thing, even if it's just one more thing about one more color, you see. Mm -hmm. So it's endless. That's what I want to say to you all. It is endless. It is um, joyful, but it can be vexing. But that business of getting through the frustration, that's what we're hoping these videos will help people. Mm -hmm. So that we give them, in a way, not permission to experiment, but a nudge. Like, hey, try this, you might discover something. That's really what I think we're offering here. Is that invitation, that's a better word. Mm -hmm. We're inviting people to have fun with it, see what's possible, and uh, be ready for the trials and the errors because that's how you learn. That's what I want to say. I do want to put a plug in and announce that Mark and I are, as we're filming this video, in the process of also filming a pre-recorded workshop on color and color mixing. It is called The Language of Color. It's very thorough, I believe, very in-depth. The subtitle says it all. Knowledge plus craft equals freedom. Yay. Uh, and there's art history in it. I mean, it is going to be very thorough, very um, beneficial, mm -hmm. I would like to say. And um, I'm very proud of what we're putting together. I think it's going to be very, very useful for a lot of folks. So definitely keep an eye on Mark's social media platforms, mm -hmm. Instagram and or Facebook. The name is mark.eans.studio or subscribe to Mark's newsletter uh, on Mark's website. You will find the little subscription form and Mark's website is markeens.com. We'll put it in the comments. Um, I do want to invite you to experiment on your own and Always. share your uh, results and share your uh, good results and bad results, your <laughs> successes and... <laughs> and let's use the word failures. And failures. Do not be afraid <laughs> of those failures. They are important. And also share with us what is color blue for you. Is it depressing? Is it mystical? Is it transcendental? Is it joyful? What does blue bring in you? Do you work with blue? Do you try to avoid it and why? All of these things are very useful, not just for us too, because we're curious, I am curious, but also for other artists who are uh, reading the comments and learning. You're all learning from each other. So please feel free to share. I need to add one more thing that just hit me. I can't believe I didn't mention this. Music, the blues. I've been thinking oh about the God, blues. Oh my God, I've got the blues. So of course <laughs> there's the other darker side to this color. They wouldn't have called it the blues for nothing. Yes. In fact, they say, once you paid your dues, then you can sing the blues. Well, we hope you're not feeling blue. <laughs> we hope you're feeling red and vibrant and all other colors, or maybe blue if that's what works for you. But do enjoy, have fun, and share with us. Take care, folks.